thanks for inviting me back. I was here last week to talk about a, a different issue, and, and today I was invited to um, comment on the university union negotiations that are ongoing right now. And <clears throat> I'm not sure what you might be most interested in, but I thought I might just start the conversation by letting you guys know how the process works and sort of where we're at and what the issues are. Um, the university's perspective on some things, and um, you know what the union's perspectives might be on some things. I won't try to represent their position, but obviously, having been in conversations with them, I have some idea of what their concerns are. So, about a year and a half ago, maybe when many of you hadn't even matriculated to Hamlin yet, um, a segment of our adjunct uh, faculty population um, voted to organize into a union under SEIU, uh, which is a, a local, it's an actually a national uh, service employees union, and they have a local chapter in many cities, including here. Um, so that uh, was voted in. And so when that happens, uh, they then have a collective bargaining group, which uh, meets with the university to create a collective bargaining agreement. And so they have a small team of folks, we have a small team of folks that meet regularly to, to draft that document. And so what that means is it's, it's an interesting process to go through. I, I haven't done it before, but you begin by sitting in a room across the table from um, the union folks, uh, the university on one side, the union on the other side, literally, with a blank piece of paper in front of you. And after some period of time, however long it might take, you have to negotiate a bargaining agreement. So you start from scratch and, and have to agree on every issue you can imagine, whether it's um, office space or email access or parking or wages or um, how courses are assigned. Everything has to be negotiated, which means agreed upon by the university and agreed upon by the union. And so the, f the first thing that you do is you cooperatively decide on what the table of contents for the collective bargaining agreement will be. And so I forget the exact number, but I think there were maybe roughly 20 different major topics to be considered in the collective bargaining agreement. That's probably true, plus or minus three or four, I forget. And the general way the process works is you bargain on everything non-economic first. And the reason for that is the economic issues are usually the most difficult. So you try to, to agree on and put aside all the other things you can in the agreement <coughs> before you get to the more, um, I don't want to say heated, but the more um, potentially contentious issues. So we've uh, agreed on all the two of those many, many articles, one being uh, compensation and the other being um, how teaching assignments are made and credited towards the adjunct faculty members. And so that's what we're currently negotiating on. Everything else has been what's called tentatively agreed upon, which means um, we've agreed on issues and we both sides have said, okay, this is fine, we'll set this aside. And then if, when we have all the articles um, agreed upon and have a collective bargaining agreement, all that gets incorporated. Um, so it's sort of a piecemeal process. And so we've met, I, you know, many, many times, I would guess, 25 to 30 times over that period of a year and a half to work on these issues. And a lot of the time is spent away from the table uh, drafting um, articles, uh, describing the conditions, uh, responding to the union's proposal, the union responding to our proposals. Sometimes proposals are very easily decided upon because, because we have very common, common interests and concerns. Some, some take back and forth across the table a number of times to come to agreement. So there's always give and take on both sides. Um, and I think the rule of thumb for bargaining is you have a good agreement with <laughs> both sides come away um, not being totally satisfied. Because it shouldn't be one side gets everything they want and the other side doesn't. So uh, that's sort of the philosophy. And it really does sort of play out that way. So there's a lot of moving parts in these agreements. As, as you would expect, it's, it's horse trading things. We'll give you this, if we give us that. So on and so, um, let me just say that it's important to recognize that 
these adjunct faculty members are regular members of our community. You probably have many of them as instructors in your classroom. They're good folks, they're good instructors, they're important at the university, we value them, which is, you know, in some sense why we're trying to put a structure in place that better represents their needs. And so when the process began, they came to us with what was sort of a list that they collected by polling their unit members as to what was most important to them. And they um, include things like some form of job security, um, compensation, benefits, working conditions, the sort of things you'd expect. So those are sort of the, the crux of the issues we've been responding to and trying to be as sympathetic to as we can, while at the same time looking after the best interests of the university. Because many of these things, as you can imagine, have uh, direct financial consequences, and we have to be mindful of those. Um, so uh, what would I say next? So we're at the point now where um, we're working on, as I mentioned, economic issues, compensation, and assignments. And let me tell you a little bit about where that sits, um, the university's perspective. Next week, you'll get a perspective from the union side. Hopefully, we'll be talking about the same numbers. Um, I have our current proposal that's on the table with me for compensation in the union's current proposal, so this is the most recent information available. We will meet again, bargaining, before your next meeting with, I think it's David Weiss, is that right? Yep. Uh, so a lot of this could change, because every meeting, incremental things happen, but these are the most current numbers. So with regard to um, what is sort of termed job security, that's not exactly the right phrase, but um, it has to, it describes how um, an adjunct has an ongoing relationship with the institution. So in other words, if I'm, if I'm teaching History 1110, assuming there is a History 1110, um, <coughs> sure there is, um, and I'm doing it well and everybody agrees I'm a good instructor and so forth, and it's going to be offered again next year, is there, any, is there any guarantee or any opportunity for me to know that I'll be the one to teach that course if it's offered for the year after or the year <coughs> after? So that's what we mean by job security. And the, and the first thing to realize is why you can't really call it job security is that course may not be offered. So if there's no need for the course, the, there is no opportunity to teach it. So we, we can't guarantee a course to an individual, what we can guarantee is if we're going to offer the course and the adjunct faculty member has performed well in the course through evaluations and input and so forth, that they would then have the right of first refusal to teach it. And we call that in the bargaining process what we've chosen to call it collectively as good faith consideration. So if you've taught uh, History 1110 a certain number of times and done it successfully, we would then agree that whenever that course is offered, you have the right of first refusal to teach it. And that's very important to the adjunct faculty to know that they're going to be the one to have that opportunity so they can do some planning. Because as you know, there are a handful of courses that are regularly offered, taught by adjunct faculty. <coughs> and currently, there's no guarantee who's going to get that course. And they want more security than that, so that's what good faith consideration deals with. So we've agreed to that concept and what we're negotiating now on what hurdles someone has to cross to get good faith consideration for a course. How many times do you have to have taught it? Do you have to receive good evaluations from students and other members of the department? And for over what period of time? So that's one of the big issues on the bargaining table right now. Okay? Um, it's called, and that's having to do with assignments. So that's our response to the union's request for um, what you might call job security. And it's actually the, probably the most common method in other uh, bargaining agreements that have been breached between adjunct faculty and institutions for how they deal with that, that issue. Do you have a question? Yeah. I did. For this um, good faith, yeah. in the, for the students particularly, like I as a student have had a lot of adjunct faculty. Mm -hmm. And when I sign up for courses, it says, determined on it and like as a student I don't personally like to sign up for a course and not know who's going to be mm -hmm. teaching it so if the adjuncts were to get this mm -hmm. like job security would their names be put on the Piper yes. course listing okay and another part of the something we've I think we've already agreed to this 
is how far in advance the assignment would be made. And they'd be made much further in advance because we would have this good faith consideration in place. So instead of it being undecided maybe a month before classes were going to start, it'd be more like five or six months in advance. Okay. At a minimum, the person's name would be on the course. Okay. Now that's excluding cases where at the last minute we have to add a course because all of a sudden, wow, there's more people taking general chemistry than we thought we need in the lab section, so we find some other teacher. Can't do that anymore. So we're, work, we're working with them on the job security issue, and again, um, you know, the issue is what are the hurdles they have to cross? And of course, they want as few hurdles as possible. We want a number of hurdles that we think represents um, a period of time it would take to demonstrate good teaching. Okay, so you'll probably hear more about that um, from David Weiss, but that's that's where the assignment issue rests at the moment. We're arguing over that issue. Not arguing. I, I should, that's a terrible term. We're not arguing. We're, we're debating where that issue should land. We, we can't decide that. They can't decide that. We have to decide it collectively. We have to agree. As you can imagine, that's difficult sometimes to do. Any other questions on that part of things? Yeah. If you have two adding faculty like teaching the same course and then you decide to go down to one course in that section, which like adjunct faculty gets to stay? Right now that's at the total discretion of the department. The adjunct really wouldn't have any input into that decision. Um, that's going to change in the bargaining agreement. The way it's currently worded in the agreement is that the um, all things being equal, it would be the one that had the most seniority. And if we if we did pull a course away from someone, if there was an equivalent course or another course they'd be qualified to teach, we would offer them that course, which they may or may not choose to take. And if a course gets canceled very late in the game, um, we're we're bargaining. Um, a course cancellation fee that the adjunct would get, even if they didn't teach the course, under the presumption that, well, they had to put work into it to prepare for it, so they should receive some compensation for it. So that's a new thing we bargained for them as, as well in the past. They would have not received anything for that work, frankly. Yeah. I know I like, um, you mentioned earlier, like, teaching assignments. Could you explain, like, what those are and, like, what is it, you know, the process of teaching assignments? Yeah, so let me say a little bit about um, how we tend to use adjunct faculty at the university. So there's a number of different ways in which we employ adjuncts. Um, for example, there are, are instances where we want to offer an upper division course um, to give students some variety in a particular field or maybe in a new area of interest in a field. And we don't have a full-time tenure track faculty member with that expertise. So we might go out into the community and say, hey, we're looking for someone <coughs> to teach this course. We might go to the U. We might go to, a, you know, if it's a business course, we might go to a, a large company and see if anybody there has the expertise. And then if they do, we would hire them to teach that course as an adjunct. So an adjunct position is a part-time position. Okay, it's important to recognize that. They're not, they're not full-time faculty members. They, they fill in in the circumstance I, I suggested they may um, be hired if we have more demand in an area than we have current faculty capacity for. Um, <coughs> you, know, you may not be aware of this, but a full-time faculty member has, has really three main jobs. Um, one is teaching, and at least in the college, that's teaching six courses a year. Right? Um, they do a lot of service to the university. They serve on committees. They advise students. They do all sorts of things in the community, all the sorts of things you oftentimes see your faculty members doing outside of the classroom, including mentoring the guys. And then they do original research and scholarship, some of which might be collaborative research with students. Other might be just professional research that they do on, on their own in their field. Okay. Adjuncts, part-time faculty, only teach. So if you're teaching one course or maybe two courses, that's a very small fraction of a full-time faculty position. And one of the, the issues in these discussions is um, there, there, are, there are adjuncts at Hamlin that um, teach as an adjunct um, as their source of employment. So they might teach a course or two here, 
They might teach a course or two at McAllister, a course or two at St. Thomas, and sort of try to pull together um, you know, a living by doing that, which is very difficult to do because the compensation isn't what a regular faculty member would receive because it's a, it's a part-time position. <coughs> designed to be a part-time position. Nobody would go into an academic career saying, my goal is to teach part-time for the rest of my life. It's, it's not going to be um, easy to do that. And so, again, when we talk about economics, part of this has to do with the adjunct union trying to create a wage scale that makes cobbling together a bunch of part-time positions add up to a very significant full-time salary. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah? I know you're talking a lot about the differences between adjuncts and regular faculty. Do you know like, what percentage of our professors are adjuncts? Or, like, Less than 20% of your classes are taught by adjunct faculty. It varies a little bit from term to term, but about that number. Nationally, the number is much higher. It's over 50%, but Hamlin has not expanded its use of adjunct faculty at the, at the expense of regular faculty. So we're not doing that here, so don't be confused by that, yeah. How much of the student's voice do you put in, like, do you factor in when you're something about bringing an adjunct back, like the evaluations at the end of the semester? Quite a bit, quite a bit. In fact, that's, that's the main concern we have, and it's very apparent. Um, before I started serving as provost, I served as dean of college of liberal arts. Every faculty evaluation you ever wrote, I read. Thousands of them. So we look at them and we pay attention. And I'm not the only one that reads it. Yeah? When you guys are like deciding who to like tenure, like hire and full time to a department, do you look to your adjuncts or do you guys generally take an outside application? Usually, yeah. For any full time hire we're going to do, we, we tend to do a national search. So we put an ad for the position in all the professional journals, Chronicle of Higher Education, and anyone is welcome to apply, including anyone who might be an adjunct faculty member. Okay. But no one would ever be excluded from applying for a position. Mm -hmm. But are they like favored at all, or do you guys well, think that it depends? It depends on how they perform. Okay. There are more than a handful of full-time faculty that I could name that you would know very well <coughs> that started as Hamlin as adjunct. Now that's not to say the vast majority of open positions are filled by adjuncts that end up being filled by adjuncts from Hamlin. That's, that's not true at all, but it happens. What's the process to become tenured? To, to become tenured. Well, you have to be a full-time faculty member hired into a tenure track position. And it's a six year evaluative process where we take a close look at your teaching ability scholarship you've done and the service you've done to the university and there are certain benchmarks you have to hit. And so your department has to basically approve you for tenure. If you're a good solid colleague that would add to the department in the university. Then uh, there's a college-wide committee that has to agree. It has people from all the areas of the college looking at your, your file. And then it comes through the dean's office. The dean has to take an independent look and make a decision. And then it goes to the president to make a decision. And then the Board of Trustee Academic Affairs Committee makes a decision on tenure or no tenure. And they have the final voice. So it's a very significant process. It scares the heck out of faculty members. <laughs> uh, in the back of the room. How many of our faculty, like the 80% that are either tenured or on the tenure track, how much are tenured and how much are on the tenure track? Do you know? Uh, it's usually. It's probably more than 70% are tenured, okay. around 30% are on the tenure track, not yet tenured. Because again, it's a six year process, so if you hire three, four, five people a year times six years, there's a pretty good chunk of folks that haven't been tenured yet. Because okay. it's a long process. Yes? So the, the agreements that you come to with the adjunct union for adjuncts at Hamlin, does that also apply like if a Hamlin adjunct goes and teaches at McAllister, no. they don't get those benefits? No. We don't have any ability to bargain for any other school. We're you know, a private entity, they're a private entity, there's no, no connection between. Yeah, Oh, I was just curious, um, are professors only adjunct professors or tenure track professors? Because like, there's associate professors, and, like, are, are those tenure track as well, or are they just on the Yeah, so the, the tenure
banking track, um, there's a hierarchy, of course, education is very hierarchical, right? There's, you start as an assistant professor. When you're tenured, you're typically promoted to associate professor. And then there's a whole other set of hoops you have to <coughs> go through in a four or five, six year process to be considered for promotion to full. <coughs> we also have instructors who have a slightly heavier teaching load and aren't responsible for doing any research. And then we will oftentimes have visiting faculty that are here for one reason or another that are full time. So if I was going to take a sabbatical, I taught in the chemistry department before I went into the dean's office and provost's office. If I was going to take a year long sabbatical, they might hire a one year visiting person to replace me for that year I'm on sabbatical. So they're visiting faculty as well. And you need, since the teaching load is six, in order to have the need to hire another full-time position, you need six open slots. So if the department is hiring, let's say, three adjuncts to fill some needs, that isn't going to translate in our ability to hire a full-time person because there wouldn't be the need for teaching six if there's only three adjunct slots that need to be filled. So there's a lot of moving parts, but I think that gives you some idea of how assignments are made and, and so forth. And some adjuncts have taught for us for many, many, many years in the same course. Some committed out. On average, over a 10-year period, a typical adjunct has taught one or two courses. So the majority of folks aren't here long term, but some of them are. Any other questions? Yeah. So is Hayward one of the, like, I was just wondering, like, along other ACTC schools, kind of there been adjunct unions trying to unionize on the other campuses? Or? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the same union that organized the adjunct here um, was organizing at McAllister in St. Thomas, and both of those efforts failed um, for a variety of reasons. It was two years ago, it was in the newspaper quite a bit. Okay. So these are union representatives coming forward to negotiate on behalf? No, it's, it's a group of adjuncts, and they have what's called a shop steward, and I think Dave Weiss will be here next week as the elected shop steward. He's a longtime Hamlin adjunct. He teaches in religion. He's a great teacher, by the way. <laughs> um, he's the shop steward, and there's a group of four or five adjuncts that are at the bargaining <laughs> table. It's not always that number. It depends a little bit on people's <coughs> schedules and so forth. And then they have two union representatives with them at the table. On our side, we have, I can tell you who it is, uh, it's myself, Margaret Tun Tunseth, who's the chief financial officer, uh, Kathy Wasberg, who is um, uh, Hamlin's legal counsel, um, Sean Hubert, who's an associate dean in education, Jane McPeak from the School of Business, and then we have one outside counsel person as well that helps represent. Um, the union does this all the time. It's their business to organize <coughs> each collective bargaining agreement, so they're very skilled at this. This is new to us, so we need some sort of counsel so we at least understand what the labor laws are, because there are a lot of things you can do that are illegal, so you have to know what the boundaries are, things you can say and can't say and so forth, and so you have to be very mindful of that. So we have legal counsel that helps us. Yeah? Um, how close are we to an agreement, and what happens if like, there isn't an agreement? Well, uh, interesting question. So we hope to get agreement. We're bargaining towards agreement. We're bargaining in good faith. I think the union is doing the same thing. Everybody wants to get this done so we can get on with things. Um, we've, we've been stalled a little bit on the economic stuff. You know, again, we'll, hopefully we'll get to that in a minute because I think it's important. Um, so we're going to mediation for the first time, which brings in a third party mediator to help um, move the bar, let's say. Um, that may or may not advance things. I think either way, we're going to be back at the bargaining table on December 9th, and hopefully the mediation will have help us will help us get across some barriers so we can get to a final agreement. Um, but there's no way to know at this point if that will happen. So we'll be back at the bargaining table on the 9th. Um, as, as I mentioned, this is a first agreement for Hamlin. We haven't had a union here with Badlands <coughs> before. And the typical length of time to bargain a first agreement is about two years. So we're, we're going to be close to that unless things happen really fast. Some go longer, some go shorter, some never reach an agreement. Um, if you get to what's called impasse, 
The university could lock out the adjuncts. The adjuncts could strike. Neither side wants that to happen. That doesn't benefit anyone. We want to get to agreement. So we're very hopeful that we don't land an impasse and have to deal with those issues because that would not be good. Nobody wants that to happen. So does, does that answer your yeah. question? <coughs> anything else before we talk about economics? Okay, so I mean, I don't want to go into too much details. You can imagine in any bargaining situation, you're going to ask for a lot from somebody, and they're going to not want to give you any more than they think is absolutely necessary to, to meet what you perceive as your need. So um, we went into the bargaining thinking that our current um, offer, in terms of what we pay adjuncts, was relatively fair and consistent with the marketplace. They came in with an exceptionally high number, which isn't, you know, unexpected because you know somehow you're going to bargain to some point. And neither, you know, neither place is going to get what they want coming out of the starting date, right? So, so that's the issue. And so we paid adjuncts a variety of rates. Um, the one you'll hear the most about from the union, appropriately so, is it's been many years since the base rate for uh, adjuncts in the CLA have seen an increase. Okay. And I'm going to talk about base salary here, so keep that in mind. There are people that make more, but the base salary has been $4,000 for quite a few years. Okay. Um, just to give you some idea around the ACTC, I've got some numbers here. Um, Bethel's base salary is $3,800. Um, Augsburg and St. Kate's are the same as Hamlin, 4,000. And as you might expect, St. Thomas and McAllister are much higher. St. Thomas last year shot their uh, base salary from 4,000 up to 5,000 when they saw the adjuncts of Hamlin were unionizing to try and stave off organization on their campus, and that was apparently successful. So St. Thomas now pays 5,000. McAllister pays at a base about 5,300. And as you know, McAllister and St. Thomas are both schools with very large endowments and, and are basically in a different financial league than Hamlin. And so we think being at a salary similar to Augsburg, while the same as Augsburg, Bethel, or higher than Bethel and St. And St. Kate's, that we're competitive in the marketplace. Now, does that mean that's a fair wage? Who's to decide? But it's competitive with the marketplace. So that's what we've been paying. Um, what we have on the table right now, our, our most current offer to the union, is a, an increase of the base up to 4448 Okay, the base salary, which is an 11% increase. And if you have the terminal degree, let me say a little bit about this, you get a bigger increase. So to be a regular faculty member, to be in a tenure track position, you need to have the terminal degree in the field which for most folks is the PhD. If you're teaching in legal studies, it might be a JD. If you're teaching in the fine arts or creative writing, it might be an MFA degree. Every area has its own terminal degree. So we want faculty with a terminal degree. Right? Those are the most experienced professionals. So if you have a terminal degree, you get an additional boost in our proposal of, what's the number here? Well, it goes up to 4,648 couple hundred dollars more, which is a 16% increase over what they were making. So our current offer puts our adjunct compensation well above the other schools in the ACTC other than St. Thomas and McAllister, which frankly we, we would argue are in a different financial situation. <coughs> and keep in mind the adjuncts can work at whatever school they choose. I mean, no one says you have to work at him when you have to work at him. <coughs> If, if salary is your number one concern, you might hire you at McAllister or St. Thomas and so on. So the marketplace matters. Now, let me just say one other thing. Their current proposal, and you'd expect it to be high, so I, you know, I'm not going to complain about that. Um, for a four credit course analogous to what I just described, is 5,500, so higher than even the wealthiest schools in the ACTC with a bump for terminal degree of um, $350, which puts the total at $58.50, which is a 46% increase over what it is right now. 
So that's where we're at. The only, only other thing I would add is the administration is being very mindful of the fact <coughs> that over the same period when the adjunct base salary of handling of $4,000 didn't increase, the faculty and staff salaries increased in about 13%. So we're very mindful of keeping, in fairness to all the faculty, keeping the adjunct salary increase, which they arguably deserve, a similar number. Not more than what other people who have invested a career here have gotten over that same period of time. So we think that's pretty fair. We're still negotiating. I don't know where it will end up, but that's where it stands. Yeah. So in this increase that's happened for the faculty, what is this going to look like for the economic impact on students? Like what is going to be the tuition raise? What is it going to be for us as students for coming to Hampton? Well, um, well, let me say two things. First of all, it will increase our cost, obviously. I'm not going to say that that's going to get passed on as a tuition increase to the students. You know, we wouldn't intentionally do that. It's not enough. It's not enough money to turn the university on its head. Although when budgets are tight, it's difficult. Um, but it will put a, a strain on university finances. It won't contribute to lowering costs, and it's, you know, it's not the adjunct's job to lower the cost of the university. But nevertheless, it's an increase. And I should also add a lot of the things I've described in terms of good faith consideration for teaching appointments, um, for managing all of the reviews and all the time that will be spent in, in dealing with the unit adds considerable <coughs> administrative cost to the institution, which is the reason why St. Thomas immediately jumped their adjunct pay to avoid a unionization, because they realized all the costs associated beyond the economic ones to having a union in place. And it also eliminates a lot of flexibility. In, in this agreement, our adjuncts would be the only adjuncts in the ACTC that have any sort of security for the course. St. Thomas and McAllister, you know, they're keeping away from that with a 10 foot pole. We've already agreed to that concept. And I don't think it's a bad idea. I mean, if adjuncts have taught for a while, they're doing a good job, I and mean, we can rely on them, all right, let's keep around. And we do have the flexibility if someone isn't performing well, like with any faculty member, of saying, well, you know, we need to make a change. We're not locked into anything, but when people are doing a good job, this contract recognizes that. Yeah? I know, like, you did say, like, adjuncts have a choice to, like, teach where they want to yeah. teach. Obviously, Hamlin wants to attract the best Absolutely. adjuncts. Um, so do you know if, like, historically there's been any, like, adjuncts leaving because Hamlin didn't have a competitive rate or if there's ever been issues like that before? No, that that to tell you the truth, we were a little bit surprised that the adjuncts organized. It came on sort of quickly. Frankly, we were caught a little off guard by it because we hadn't sensed any real issues. We had no um, you know, reason to think adjuncts were not teaching here because of the salary. Um, we wish they had just come to us and, and had a conversation because I think a lot of these things could have been worked out, but we didn't get that opportunity. As soon as they file for a union, the university is no longer allowed to do anything proactive because it's considered an unfair labor practice. So once they voted to unionize, which happened very quickly, we were then pre prevented from saying, well, let's talk or, or, or what if, you know, can we offer you this? Can't do it, it's against the law at that point, which is very inhibiting. So you may, if you were here then, you may have, you know, this is kind of an odd way to put it, but not noticed much was going on because there wasn't much we could say. Yeah. Is it like an idea of how many faculty are uni trying to unionize versus how many oh. adjunct faculty aren't? Um, it's a fraction of the overall adjuncts. It's the number of people I think is in the 80s in any given semester. That are trying to get a union? Well, they had the unions here. Yeah, the, the union unions group. here. But How many are a part of the union? Because I've talked to about students. a third. Okay. Roughly. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it's only undergraduate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm really easier. So I'm not sure. Sorry, there's two questions. Sure. How much tenure faculty are getting paid? Like, what is their base? I don't know if it's like per class or per year. And also, have you asked their opinion? On this, because if some of them have been adjunct faculty before, mm -hmm. maybe they have like 
a view from both sides? Well, you know, I can't speak <coughs> on behalf of all the faculty because we haven't we haven't asked that question. Um, in terms of how faculty are paid, they get a salary that's somewhat based on rank, assistant associate full, mm -hmm. and then whatever annual salary increases might contribute to that. They're not paid per course or per project. It's, it's like any other job in the world. You have a salary and you have multiple functions you have to perform. Yeah. And they are paid on a performance basis. So every year we evaluate the performance in teaching scholarship and service, and then if it's a year when the university is able to do a salary increase, it's based on that performance. <coughs> I just, I, I can't speak for the faculty. I wouldn't want to, oh, yeah. to do that. I just wonder if you guys had asked. Yeah. I think there's a mixed mixture of opinion. Are there issues that the university doesn't like, want to budge on in this? Or, I mean, are you guys like, pretty flexible about most things? Well, you can't, you can't not budge, because that's considered to be a bargaining impact. We, we have an internal sense of what our financial capacity is. And that is influencing what we put on the table. I mean, if we had a eight hundred million or eight hundred million endowment like McAllister, we might say, "Well, okay, let's give him seven thousand dollars a course. Why not?" Uh, we can afford, we're not in that position. Speak to the trend of more having more adjunct faculty in higher education in general? Well, it's increasing, uh, largely for reasons of cost. <coughs> and where you see the most increases are at the large research universities, where adjuncts do um, much more of the teaching and the faculty are much more engaged in research and, and grant report writing. So a place like the University of Minnesota, a uh, faculty member is probably going to teach two courses a year. And the rest of the time is mainly devoted to research and some to service. And the majority of the courses, um, at least at the introductory level, are probably taught by adjunct faculty. Um, we, we obviously try not to do that. In fact, we endeavor to have our most senior faculty in the introductory courses wherever we can because we think that best suits the needs of the new students they have that are, tr that are trying to learn how to navigate the institution and, and meet some of the faculty that are going to be here. But yeah, it's, it's over 50% nationally. And again, we're at less than 20%. And that's intentional, and we see no reason to change that. Yeah? Do you know the financial numbers for like the U of M, for like adjunct? Oh, they pay a lot more. Yeah. But, you know, they have state tax dollars to yeah. <laughs> take care of that. So you do pay for it, just in a different way. <laughs> it's a lot more. It's a lot more. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, since like they're demanding for uh, higher wages, I wouldn't say demand. Okay. They're, they would like to have. Oh, they yeah. would like to have. So does that mean even their roles will increase? Like they'll have more roles uh, they have to play, not only teaching. No. Or okay. no. No change to the job description. Well, what about healthcare benefits for adjuncts? Like, how is that being impacted by like? <laughs> Yeah. So typically to be eligible for health benefits, and this is true I, th I think in any of the ACTC schools or, or most employers, you have to be more than half time okay. to be benefits eligible. Okay. And given how much an adjunct teaches at a typical institution, they don't hit that mark. Okay. I was uh, reading a response to President Miller's email sure. about and one of the things that I was kind of curious about is they keep bringing up this idea of that um, debts incurred by the Anderson Center and the St. Louis Park campus and like the Summit Mansion are all taking away from the adjunct union. Is that true? Or, or like, I'm not taking away from the union itself, but um, funds that could possibly go into a well, of course. I mean, anytime we make a decision to spend money here versus there, it has an impact. Um, I think when the Anderson Center was being conceived, it was very controversial. Not everyone thought it was um, what we needed to do next. Now that it's there, I think most people, including myself, and I was a little bit on the really skeptical side at the time, um, I can't imagine the campus without it. So 
so yes, it costs us a lot of money. Um, we have some long-term debt associated with that, which impacts the operating budget, but I think most people would argue at this point that it was a facility we absolutely needed to give you guys the sort of experience that you expect. But again, that, that's a decision that was made. Was it the right decision, wrong decision? Well, I don't know, time will tell. Nobody has a crystal ball. Like three yeah. minutes, three minutes left. Okay, okay. sure. No. sure. Um, now, I've never been very good at keeping up to date on things, so I was wondering if you could give me like, or us a timeline of how this all went down, because it kind of sounded like it happened really fast. And I was wondering if, like, when the adjuncts, you, like, when did the adjuncts vote to have the union? And, like, a year and a half started? ago, and so, you need to get a certain, so you, you decide what the group is you want to organize. So this is on the adjunct side. Mm -hmm. So it would be <coughs> undergraduate, you know, undergraduate, te faculty who teach undergraduates um, on the St. Paul campus. There are a few other criteria, but that's the main piece. You have to get a certain percentage of them to vote to certify a union. So the university doesn't need to know any of that's happening. They, they're just, do, you know, knocking on doors and trying to recruit people to vote. And they did that effectively, and the vote happened, and um, it, it led to the um, formation of the union group. So the university really didn't have any role in that, and really we're not allowed to have any role in that. It'd be an unfair labor practice to try and prevent them from organizing. Mm -hmm. So So that was a year and a half ago? Yeah. Like when we started looking for a new president? Or? Uh, who? Do you remember, Alan, where that happened relative to President Hansen's I think it was before okay. the announcement was made that she was retiring, but, but don't, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it was. Okay. Any other last questions? So you're going to hear from the union folks next week? Yes. Um, it actually will not be David Weiss. He was unable to make it. Oh. He is sending one other representative for sure. Um, Mark Felton will be here oh, yeah. for sure. He's and in the then, business school. Yeah, and then possibly Jen Beckham. If she can. Yep. yep, she teaches in the English department. Okay, well, if you have any questions um, as a result of this or after you meet next week, send me an email, come by and see me, bring me back if you want to, I'm happy to answer whatever I can. And we hope to get to a completed agreement as soon as possible. Yeah. Thanks for your questions. Thank you.